Okay, so, uh, well, I'll be uh, speaking about themes that uh, have been uh, discussed already, in particular, the issue of multi-scale, how you relate scales, and uh, renormalization group. So, um, when I mean learning physics here, and I'm a mathematician, so not full expert of physics, what I, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm realizing wrong file. <laughs> and that's quite important uh, for what we are. Uh, is it, <laughs> no, it's just the length of the talk. I, there was something bizarre. Yes, so I'll be speaking about modeling and body problems in physics at equilibrium. So there is no time here. And so the goal uh, of the game really is to uh, estimate the energy, in other words, to model the probability distribution at the Boltzmann's uh, probability distribution. And I'll be looking at different problems from toy models, such as 5-4 or easing for the one who knows, and progressively going into more and more uh, complex problems. And the key questions that I'll be asking here, which is at the center of all machine learning, is how come we can learn such uh, complex, high-dimensional uh, problems, whether it's with deep learning or other structures. The reason, essentially, is that we have priors. We have prior, which defines limited uh, sets of models that can be encoded into the architectures. And in the case of physics, we know a lot of things about physics. What kind of priors can machine learning uh, techniques be using to solve these problems in high dimension? So I'll try to focus on one answer, which is scale interactions. And I would like to show here that scale interaction allows to go pretty far by mixing physics and uh, machine learning. And of course, when going through this path, we'll have natural question emerging why should we use deep uh, structure? Why nonlinear? What do we really learn uh, on this path? So let me begin with, and I'll be concentrated on relatively simple models. So models which are is where the log probability is linear as a function of the parameters. So of course, the whole problem is to define this representation, which is going to linearize the problem. And in this framework, learning the parameters is convex, that's not the problem. So the central question here is going to be, okay, what are the priors that allows to linearize problems as complicated than that? So the first kind of ideas that the community has been working a lot on, and myself also, is to use priors from symmetries because of course it's very natural in physics. And from these symmetries, you can specify properties such as covariance properties on your representation. Now, the problem of that is that the knowledge we have on symmetries is limited, and in particular, very often limited to small size groups, such as translation rotations. And when I speak in diffeomorphism, generally, it's very, very partial, the information that we know. Sparsity has been mentioned. It's also useful, but not always present, in particular in turbulent fluids. And again, these are not sufficient in terms of prior to build up models that can describe probability distribution in very high dimensional models. One of the key idea that I believe is very central to build models and within the current deep networks is the regularity across scale. And that, of course, is an idea that is all that dates back to the ideas of renormalization group as it was developed by Kadanoff and Wilson. So the idea is you take a field and you progressively coarsen it by averaging, subsampling, averaging, subsampling. This idea has been present in many of the talks that we've seen. Now, the observation that is behind the renormalization group is that if you look at the probability distribution of your field, but at different scales, so you're going to look at that, and if you parametrize this probability distribution by some set of parameters, the evolution of this probability distribution is very regular if you renormalize the field. 
In particular, if you had phase transitions, then the probability distribution will remain identical, so you are going to have a fixed point. But most problems are not at phase transition, so you have these very strong regularity properties that goes across scale. What I'd like to show is that this is enough to go quite far to build up models in physics. So what does it mean to be very regular? Let me go in the other way. You begin from coarse scale and you progressively move up the scale. It means that if you look at the conditional probability of the field at a fine scale given a coarse scale, this evolution is something that you should capture with relatively few parameters if indeed you have an evolution which is regular. Now, if you can do that, then of course what you are going to do is express your field as a coarse field. This is low dimensional, not too difficult. And then you are going to stack up the probability distributions, the conditional probability distribution, which progressively allows you to go up the field. So it's a kind of Markov chain, but across scales. So, the problem that is raised within the renormalization group is to understand that kind of probability distribution. And since at high resolution, you have all the information that is included at coarse resolution, to understand how to move up, basically you have to understand how to create the high frequencies that will reconstruct that. So you need to extract the degrees of freedoms that have disappeared when you go from one scale to the other and to define a coordinate system to do so. Now, the, what coordinate system is present? This is an idea that has been very much studied, and there is a very natural coordinate system that comes from the fact that you want invariance or covariance to translation rotations, which are wavelets. So let me explain that. Basically, you are going to decompose your field over high frequencies, but instead of using sine wave, you are going to lose localized wave in order to express the local properties of your fields, and you are going to represent these uh, high frequencies within these bases. So let me illustrate that. That means you take an image, for example, you decompose into the low frequency. These are the orthogonal complements that are actually computed by projecting your field over the wavelet. They look, in this case, a little bit like white noise, but it is not. And you can then continue like that. So the whole problem now is to compute the conditional probability of this given this. In other words, of this, since this can be successful, given its wavelet coefficients. OK, what it means? It means that, in fact, I've taken a very complicated problem decomposed it into very low dimensional problem, and then having to model each of these conditional probabilities. These conditional probabilities, so it's about learning the high frequencies, knowing the low frequencies, we are going to model them with a distribution. So if you do the renormalization, this is what's going to happen. You begin from low frequency, from that you model the high frequencies from which you reconstruct the next scale from which you compute the high frequencies, you model, you sample the high frequencies, and so on. The claims I'm going to do is the following. These conditional probability distribution, they have interaction energies, if you wish, which are relatively simple, relatively local. Not only that, but their log probability most often are convex although the original probability is absolutely not convex, so that you can sample fast. OK, to illustrate that, I'm going to show you a number of examples. I'm going to begin with very classic one, the one that comes from uh, easing, or which is also called phi 4. Basically, what you have is a model where you have a log probability, which is defined by the kinetic energy. You have a potential energy, which is a scalar potential energy. In this case, it has two wells near minus 1 and 1, a bit like uh, that's the continuous version of easing. If you are above critical scale temperature, sorry, you have a disordered system. At the critical temperature, you have a very organized system with long-range interactions. These are the evolutions of the potentials across scale. 
So this one at very coarse scale looks Gaussian, but as you move across scale, you progressively get your double well. Here at uh, critical temperature, essentially the potential doesn't vary across scale. Now, if in this case you compute the log probability, you can define a simple linear model that we're not going to go into the details. The remarkable thing is that this model just gives you the evolutions across scale. It is convex, although these are not convex in neither of these cases, and therefore you have a fast sampling. In other words, for the one who know that kind of thing, you have no critical slowing down. You can sample the field very quickly if you sample the conditional probability. Okay, this is a known case. Let's move to a non-known case. These are weak lensing images. That's now an important mo problem because you have this satellite Euclid that is going to be sent. Basically, what you see in front, this is images of mass. What you see as bright elements are uh, galaxies, and you would like to learn the probability distribution of mass. The problem now, this is not a local model. You have gravitation, and you have long-range interaction. You can use the same kind of linear models, but it's at each of the scale. The models are local, but because it's multi-scale, you get global interactions and you can estimate and sample your field. In this case, it's not just that you generate, you have an explicit expression of the whole energy that is being uh, decomposed. Now, if you do that, the problem is that it's too simple. These models with scalar energy, you are not going to capture geometric structure such as turbulence. So the next stage is to understand that. The big problem, as I said, and for me very central, is to understand how to model interaction across scale. What is the difficulty? When you look at data at different scale, they correspond to different frequency bands. They oscillate with a phase which is, goes at different frequency, so they are not correlated. So any linear model is bounded to fail. Now, what you can do is to separate the phase and the modulus. If you take the modulus, so you can do it with a rectifier, and in fact, we also did it with a rectifier. You can look at the correlation between the coefficients and uh, the modulus, or the correlation of the modulus. These are absolutely non-zero. You have strong correlations, and you can do a reduction of these huge covariance matrices, and for reasons that these are, have regularities, these covariances are again going to be compressed by doing another transform with wavelets. So let me show you the kind of structure we're getting. What I'm getting is that this kind of structure is essentially a deep net, but without learning. And the reason why we don't need to learn here is because we know physics, or at least know enough of physics. This is the first decomposition with the different high frequency wavelet coefficients at different scales. And then, as I said, you apply the modulus and you propagate. So that's also called a skip connection. And as I said, you do a second wavelet transform. And then you compute, you normalize everything. And you compute the covariance, so the correlation of the coefficients at different scale. So it's actually a deep network without learning any of the weights. And you get a model of low dimension. Here are the kind of results. These are images. So basically, because the statistics that you need are relatively small, 1,000, you can learn from one single uh, image you model, or you can learn with multiple uh, realization. These are the images that have been synthesized with these renormalization group decomposition, where we just model the conditional probability from one scale to the other with the moments that I've described. The total number of moments here is 1,000. Okay, to describe a field, you have the statistics of a field of about, uh, in that case, about 500,000 uh, pixels. Now, you can test by verifying moments, second order, third order, fourth order moments. We tried essentially most moments, you get a quite precise uh, uh, recovery of the statistic of the original field. 
but it's not sure. These are high dimensional distribution. You are never insured. This is an untractable problem to prove that you have something which has the same statistics. And I've put that because of the discussion. Okay, we have a model with now 1,000 variables. We know everything in the sense that we know exactly the decomposition of the energy. Is it interpretable? It's a question, and it's really not clear. At least one thing which is sure is that that kind of field doesn't require any learning once you realize what is important to learn in these problems. So let me finish uh, with that. My, what I wanted to essentially say is that a lot of things that are being done around groups is, I believe, not enough. And probably one of the strongest elements of regularity is the regularity across scale. In other words, computes the scale interaction models. Where is learning coming in? Learning is fundamental the day you deal with structured problems. When you deal with structured problem, whether it's in uh, molecular biology, whether it's faces, we've been synthesizing faces with, with that kind of strategy, you cannot use the simple models that I showed. You need to use much more complex model, and there we're using deep, net, uh, deep network to learn the scale interaction, so you end up with something like a unit uh, structure. But for many physics problem, the message is you may not need such complex structure in order to, lear to, to learn the kind of energies once you do the appropriate factorization. Thank Thanks. Who was first? Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a clarification question. So should I be thinking of this wavelet transform happening in the dimensionality of like the number of free parameters or the spatial dimension of the data? It's in the spatial dimension of okay. the data. So then a follow-up question for that would be, um, so you have two indices for the wavelet transform in 2D. Uh, how does the number of indices scale with the number of spatial dimensions? Okay, you have an orthogonal basis. So the number of element of the basis is exactly equal to the size of the image. So the total number of indices is equal to, so the indices is scale and translation and rotation. They, these are the three, three indices. And the total number of indices, in other words, the number of wavelets, is equal to the number of pixels because it's an orthogonal basis. Okay, okay. So if I so in three dimensions, should I expect like similar number of basis functions as I would with like spherical harmonics, or is that yeah, off? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, like so that that kind of would, 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 or Fourier basis. Fourier basis. It's yeah. another basis than the Fourier basis. Got it. The only got thing it. it's local. Local. Okay, great. Important. Thank you. Okay, so so you started with a, a Boltzmann distribution that you wanted to sample, right? And you then upscale. And so at the end, is it possible to actually evaluate a, a statistical weight to metropolize or when you, or is the transformation not invertible? I mean, is there a way of actually, so if I wanted to, you know, do Monte Carlo yeah. starting from, you know, a fine or, you know, a small scale s simulation, right? And then upscale, is it, is it possible to, to compute the weight in the larger system or no? Yeah. Well. If you have a coarse scale, the coarse scale distribution, if you want to build up your uh, Gibbs energy at the fine scale distribution, you need to compute this conditional probability. And that's what we do. And then you sample the conditional probability with uh, uh, MCMC or Langevin. That's exactly what we do. OK, OK. And because you are convex, it converges fast. And we precondition. And in fact, the renormalization is a way to precondition the distribution, you can view it that way. Okay. That was a, I really enjoyed the talk. I don't know if you understood everything, but I, I, I really enjoy it. Yes. And I, I have a couple questions for you. I understand why you don't want the localized functions, but I have a question. How local is local based? That makes a difference uh, what you do. And the second one is, I can see this method working for problems like the Ising or even uh, <coughs> some other problems like uh, in the end, but uh, 
is going to work for every problem that base this renormalization. So how do I know in advance where it's going to work? Okay, so I'll answer each of the first one is how local is local. That's the principle of multi-scale. You have very local and then intermediate, intermediate, and that, that's how the, the basis is built. To what does it uh, apply? But how do we start? That's what I'm saying. If I'm going to do this problem in practice, how do I start? You see, after, as I start to move, I understand it, but you have to have an initial stage, right? That's basic. The initial, I mean, you take your, uh, your field, your image, you decompose it at all the scales. It's a decomposition in an orthogonal basis. And then where you start from very coarse scale, at very coarse scale, often you have a Gaussian process, but you may not, but you are in low dimension, so you can go brute force, and then you learn progressive. Now, to what does it apply? In all what we did, uh, we applied it to uh, ergodic stationary uh, process, so including cosmology, what you saw is the cosmic web. So these are non-trivial uh, structure or uh, turbulent structure. Does it apply uh, to images? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, general images like something like uh, 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 just uh, yeah. I think turbulence and icing is very easy to see that it's going to work. Uh, Makes turbulence is a non-trivial problem. Yeah, but at least it, it, it yeah. has a feeling that should behave like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Icing is obvious. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, the what is very non-obvious are images like images like here. These images have one property: if you look at their Fourier transform they have an one over omega decay. They are essentially multi-scale, okay? And there has been engineers showing that if you look at the conditional probability of high frequencies over low frequency, you have a tendency to Gaussianize it. We did the same kind of thing on images, I didn't show it because this was about physics, of images of faces. The only thing, as I was saying, is that the conditional probability distribution are much more complicated. So. My, my statement here is not to say easy, no. The problem is not easy. I'm just saying it's much more, it's much easier once you extract this conditional probability. And many talks were essentially saying, look, we begin by coarsening and we try to go across. So it's a way to go across. And if the problem is very complex, such as faces, then the conditional probability is getting much more complex. I want to follow up on the previous question. So if in your talk you wanted to preserve the statistics of the original signal, if instead someone told you to preserve only some statistic of the original signal, some fixed statistic, uh, to give a very banal example, the class of, an ob class of an object in an image, how would one change this process? That I don't know, unless the specific uh, probabilities are easily expressed within this kind of basis. It may, uh, it, it may not work uh, at all. But in this case, the idea is not just to reproduce a statistic, it's really to get the energy. At the end, what you get is an expression of the energy. You have, if you, now, this is in a static uh, framework, but if you have the energy, you can access to forces. And so that's really, in some sense, my goal not just to generate images. Generating is a way to verify that you have access to the energy of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've got a representation theory question. So if I think about like the Fourier basis as the basis functions for the irreps of translation and spherical harmonics as the basis functions for like the irreps of, in, in this case, like 3D rotation, should I be thinking of the wavelets as the basis functions for the irreps of the renormalization group, or can I also think of them as some sort of hybrid, uh, hybridization or some product of the translation and rotation irreps? Okay, so the way the wavelet basis don't give you eigenvalues okay. to any specific operators, okay. but they nearly diagonalize very large class I of see. operators. So it's like a, al almost, it's like it's not quite. I see. And it allows to capture pointwise nonlinear phenomena. So if you take easy, it's fundamental. You don't want just to diagonalize the dilation. You want to deal with the nonlinear part. That's why you need to be somewhere in the middle. middle OK, middle. OK. Kind of best of both worlds, but it's, yeah. it's so it can't quite, quite be on either, you either don't side. don't diagonalize yeah. anything. OK, OK, thanks. 
Just, just one more. Uh, thanks, Stefan. I, 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 I still think I need uh, a lot of time to process this, but um, uh, one, 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 one thing that occurred to me was, was the following. Uh, we, 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 since you were looking at turbulence, after you reconstruct, after you, you, um, uh, you, you build, you build these, generate these images from from course from from start, starting from a course level, you uh, you uh, generate these these fine scale. Um, uh, uh, st uh, representations of, of, of turbulence. Did you check that, uh, for instance, you recover uh, known results from the the spectrum of fluctuations in turbulence? Th this is this is recovered after after you do this. This is still satisfied. Is that right? Spectrum for sure. Uh, structure functions. Uh, uh, third order moments with by spectrum we checked. Right. But I'm sure that there are errors on high order moments. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm not stating it's, uh, but the standard, let's say, low order or three, order three moments right. and, and uh, structure function, yes. Okay. Th then just, just one more thing, something that's, that's uh, I haven't formulated in ve very well in my mind yet, but I'm gonna try to do it in the moment, uh, is um, uh, you, could you, you and I spoke a little bit about dynamics, potentially learning, uh, uh, dynamics using these representations. Um, uh, could, could you uh, envision somehow uh, somehow putting putting uh, uh, l having the learning of these distributions uh, being guided by the dynamics itself, or being being uh, uh, yeah, so influenced that, by the dynamics? I, I think yeah. Now, the, obviously, the, the dynamics is a fundamental question. So. The naive way to think about it is to say, okay, if at equilibrium you have, let's say, a very compressed representation because 1,000 moments is very compressed for a high dimensional distribution, you could think of looking at the dynamics of these moments uh, across, uh, across time, but it's very possible that the time look at the problem can also give a different look and you uh, add the representation. So that I, I don't know, these are uh, open questions really. Is there one more question? Let's take it.